There was a time when classical music was as much a part of a British seaside holiday as paddling on the beach, donkey rides and strolling on the promenade. Every major resort around the country had its own professional orchestra giving concerts during the summer season and many famous British conductors, including Malcolm Sargent, served their time with them. Now there's just one left. The Scarborough Spa Orchestra, based in a magnificent Victorian building overlooking the town's South Bay. And they're still drawing the crowds after 99 years. Why is this such a success story when the other seaside orchestras have faded away? What's their secret? What better way to find out than to spend a day with the orchestra at the start of their summer season? It's just so different. There's nowhere else in the country where I know you can get an outdoor concert of this quality. And with a sea view. Just super. Love Scarborough. <laughs> I say the spa, the spa is absolutely synonymous with Scarborough. You know, and whoever you talk to, wherever you go, and you mention Scarborough, they all mention the spa. And they all must come to listen to the orchestra. And, that, and you can have a cup of tea, you can have a bacon sandwich, enjoy yourself. That's what it's all about. It's like Victorian, isn't it? It's going back. It's not modern and trashy. It's genteel. Well, here we are on the coast in Scarborough on this glorious early summer morning, gentle breeze, waves lapping on the seawall below, and behind me the uh, glorious Victorian standstone building of the Scarborough Spa. And in front of me I can see what I think is probably the famous Sun Court with its little domed bandstand and white columns. So looking forward to getting inside there and, uh, and seeing what it's like. That must be one of the players there in their wonderful striped jackets of red, black and white. Looks like they've just perhaps come from a regatta. He's a percussionist by the looks of his uh, music folder. Can I say good morning? My name is Matthew Rowe. I think you must be a member of the Scarborough Spa Orchestra. You don't think I dress like this for fun, do you? <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. And we're just uh, concert shortly this morning. Yeah, 11 o'clock. Yeah, nice day for it. It's always Wonderful. great when the sun's out. It's um, not so much fun uh, on the northeast coast when the sun's not shining because you get that nasty wind. But it's lovely. When the sun's out, it's unique. It's lovely in there. Marvellous. I was very rude. Not to, I was very rude not to ask your name at the beginning. Oh, my name's Lee. Lee Adams. I'm, uh, I've been here for about nine years now. I think this is my ninth season. Wonderful. And you've got a shaker there, a whistle, yeah, this is, and uh, uh, one other. Right. Well, this is a whistle. No noise-making device. This is my ratchet. This is for the fairy, the clockwork fairy. Hang on. That's the clockwork fairy being wound up. This is my shaker for my holiday in Cuba. <laughs> so, well, it looks yeah. like you're all set. I think uh, I'd better get in and take my seat. Yeah, do so. Enjoy the concert. I will do. Thank you, Lee. Bye-bye. So walking into the sun court here, open-air seating for the audience, many of them in deck chairs, sitting on top of a chessboard like black and white tiled floor. And then to my left is the uh, stage, which is a, a bandstand, uh, which is covered with a little domed roof. And then either side there's a sort of line of uh, white columns which are linked together with huge glass windows, which give an almost uninterrupted view of the sea uh, and the wonderful South Bay. A few members of the orchestra gathering on the platform. I can see four there, and I think... Uh, um, violinist has just arrived, uh, and I think I can see the music director, Paul Laidlaw, up there, too. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Music in the Air. 
When we're in Scarborough, we come and see them. We got fond memories because I used to bring my mother, and she used to love to come and sit. And she's no longer with us now. But uh, we think of Mum when we come here because it was a favourite place in Scarborough. We only live down the coast in Filey, but they are so good, so professional, and uh, I mean it's. it's it may be a little bit old-fashioned for many people, but actually, it, it, it's lovely music, and it, it, it's, it's summer has come when, when, when the season starts. This is the other half, and he's much more knowledgeable than I am. Oh, hello. Hello, good morning. Good morning to you. Yes, yes, sir. We think they're absolutely wonderful. How long have you been coming to the, um, only these about concerts? four years, actually. Sorry, yes, only about four years, although we've lived in the area for much longer, and we came one morning for you a few years back for the morning and immediately after the concert went out and bought season tickets and we've not regretted it for one moment um, and of course the, the, the last seaside orchestra in the country and um, I just hope that they continue to go for many more years because they're lovely people and super, super musicians It's immediately obvious, chatting with the audience in the Sun Court, that their relationship with the orchestra is unusually warm and intimate. Many of them are on first-name terms with the players, and this is pretty rare in my experience. After the morning concert, I spoke to Paul Laidlaw, the musical director and pianist, and asked him about this closeness. Well, they are incredible. I mean, we have a, a wonderful battalion of, of great supporters who are season ticket holders, and come, you know, some of them come to every single concert in a season. I, mean, I wouldn't do that if it wasn't paid. Um, you know, you have that great support. And they, they are very defensive of the orchestra. You know, if anybody suggests for one moment that, that an orchestra is not necessary, they're there straight away saying that, you know, we want this and they support it in that way. Similarly, they've heard this for the last several years. And, you know, they, they, they'll say, you know, that went a bit off kilter today, didn't it? And I said, well, yeah, it's the wind, you know, it's something's coming, somebody turned a page at the wrong place or something like that. But, you know, they, they are with it. So, so they're wonderfully critical, but at the same time incredibly supportive. And it is, it is very, like, for me, it's lovely to go out there and you see the faces that you know and you say, how are you, you know, how's Hilda, has she had the baby yet? And all of that sort of thing going on. And that mixed with the, what we call passing trade, people who are here just for the day, suddenly discover that there's a concert and come on. And then there are people who specifically book their fortnight's holiday every year. And they come and they get through their, what would it be, 18 concerts. So what do you feel the orchestra's role is in Scarborough? I think it's, it's many-fold. I was going to say two-fold. It is many-fold. I mean, primarily we're here as a source of entertainment. That's what we do. You know, we, we play concerts for people to enjoy. We're not here to educate, although sometimes in a bit of the chat in between the numbers I will say, you know, this is by Glazunov, who wrote lots of symphonies, and he also wrote these things. You've got, you do, it's a bit like being a, a radio presenter, actually, in that way, a bit like, you know, 
not education as such, but information. And I think probably you're also introducing, certainly with the people who come for the first time or who are coming from other places, I'm sure you're also introducing them to lots of pieces that they haven't heard. I think that's certainly true. And it's amazing the number of people who say, can you just write the title of that down? They want to go and and get a recording of it or or play it themselves. The orchestra's schedule isn't for the faint-hearted. They play nine concerts a week for four months during the summer season, both in the outdoor sun court and the Grand Hall. This is a demanding workload, especially as each concert is completely different. Listening to them perform, I was struck by the rich and colourful sound they produce, which is surprising given the small size of the orchestra. There are ten players, but uh, in number of instruments that that we play, there are probably about 25 instruments because uh, everybody doubles and trebles all over the place to give us lots of different textures and and qualities. And, in fact, that allows us to play the variety of music that we play. The actual breakdown is uh, violin, cello, double bass. Then there are three woodwind players playing flute, clarinet, bassoon, but they double saxophones and also double clarinets occasionally when you want more of that. A trumpet player, trombone player, big percussion and uh, piano. There's an enormous range of colour. I loved, loved hearing their wonderful variety of timbre that this really very small group could produce um, in the space of a single concert this morning. I um, think a lot of I that think. comes from the fact that we do take the music apart and almost start again and say, what is missing? What do we need? What's important? What can be doubled? What needn't be doubled? So you're kind of on the hoof reorchestrating for this ensemble. How do you go about choosing the repertoire? We kind of know our audiences here, and we know the sort of things that they like. What we, what we pride ourselves on is the variety of stuff that we do within a concert. You know, so you might get Dance Macabre, and then you might get a, a piece of swing music by George Gershwin, and then you might get a novelty number. We like to do, a, in a, certainly in the morning concerts, we like to do a, a, a variety of things. The evening concerts, um, we have one evening which we call our classical evening, but we don't like that to frighten people. It just means you're not going to get a selection from a musical and you're not going to get a, a novelty whistling tune or something like that. You know, it's going to be more, but not, I mean, you know, we, we aren't going to complete works of Wagner or anything like that. Right. So, so your role as music director isn't just a case of sitting at the keyboard and, and acting as the conductor and leader and pianist and all that. You also, you also talk to the audience... Tell us what you feel that, that you know, what, what's important about that in your, in your role. It takes the stuffiness out of it. It's very important that the enjoyment of what we're doing comes across the, the, the lights to, to the audience so that they, are, they feel safe and comfortable and that, that it's, a, a, you know, an exciting experience. <laughs> Thank you. 
Watching the orchestra's morning concert in the open air, it occurred to me how hard the players were working on stage. Not only were they doubling up on instruments, but there was quite a breeze to contend with too. As a musician, it's no fun when the music starts to blow around and page turns are particularly problematic when you need both hands to play. This is Catherine Seabrook and Graham Quilter's 24th season with the Scarborough Spa Orchestra, so they're well used to outdoor conditions. Cathy plays the flute, piccolo and saxophone, and Graham the clarinet and also the saxophone. When we're playing outside, we have what we call wind irons, which are long metal poles which hook over the sides of our music. Um, and you're trying to turn pages, and at the same time, the wind's blowing, but the metal iron might fall off. And so then you keep trying to play, pick up your wind iron, and, you know, I think the audience enjoy the live side of the, the music when it's blowing around. I think we, we had one iron lost this morning, didn't we? I think we had Mike's iron lost this morning when he was trying to do a very quick page turn. Yes. So and then, you, then his shoulder rest fell off his shoulder as rest well. Fell off. And then when I was in the middle of a solo, I had just turned my page and I'm in the middle of the solo and the wind blew my page back over. So I then have to start playing from memory whilst, my, whilst Chloe, who was sitting next to me, was reaching across and putting my music back on the stand and holding it for me. Whilst I'm, and I'm sort of saying, thank you very much, thank you very much, by <laughs> nodding, you know. It's all terribly exciting and stuff. Of, and, of course, as a wind player, it's very hard to laugh and play. It is. <laughs> At least it if is. you're a string player, you can. Yes. yes. <laughs> what we do is we, um, we shuffle our feet. So, like that. Yeah, I think that's why the audience like us. They see all the different looks, you know. If, you know, you're going through so much music, there's something that, that might go right or wrong. Um, and so you have a little shuffle for good solos or you might have a wink or a nod. It's all part of the show. <laughs> things are going to go wrong. Anything that's live, things can go wrong. Our job is to make that minimal. But if it is, there's no point in pretending it hasn't. You have a wry smile and you raise an eyebrow and you go, well, we'll get it right next, you know. But, I mean... <laughs> Quite frankly, I'm amazed at how little goes wrong, given the amount that we do. I think the, the main challenge is to keep fresh and keep going all season. Because when you're doing, you know, we do two concerts a day. Where, is it nine a week we're doing at the moment? Yeah. Um, and you could come to every single concert for the entire season and you wouldn't hear the same concert twice. You, you occasionally hear the same pieces, but um, th there are pieces in our library that we play once a season. And so, I don't know what nine weeks time... Uh, sorry, um, 16 weeks time, n nine concerts a week are, but that's a heck of a lot of music that you have to keep on top of, you have to keep concentrating. So it's a huge amount of repertoire. How, how do you rehearse it all? Well, we don't rehearse it all. Um, because so many of the band are people like us who've done it for many years, we, we do tend to work really well as a team. Before every single concert... We talk every single piece through, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's our talk-through time. So the concert does start, the morning concert, at 11, but we are ready by 10.30, and we go through every single piece in the talk-through. We discuss all the repeats, uh, the signs, whether we're cutting, whether, you know, you're going to yeah. do this one fast. So the pulse stays the same right through that whole sequence. Great. Uh, end of that section, there's a cut-off. It's uh, Cathy leading Piccolo lead into number five. Little row at the end of that. So section. yes, the talk through is our rehearsal time. That is when we nail the pieces. There's always been a controversy. Uh, every recording I've heard is much faster than I've ever heard us play. Oh, it's it. Quick. Oh, 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 oh. 
is I, that's the recording I have. I'm just saying that I've heard it done. All right, we'll beat the difference. Yep. Oh, is that what it is? Well, let it, let it come as a lovely surprise. There's no other job like this one, um, and you either love it or you hate it. Violinist Mike Gray is using some leave from his job with the BBC Concert Orchestra to play the season in Scarborough. He did six summers with the Spa Orchestra when he was starting out and feels this time was vitally important. For me, 16 years ago, it was my first professional engagement and it was a huge learning curve, but it taught me an awful lot about playing in a chamber group and my own playing. I knew how to work things out quickly and sight reading as well really comes on when you're doing a job like this. So it laid the groundwork for my professional career. Um, because there isn't a buffer of me having sort of a section of 20 or whatever. You are responsible for what you do. So although we're playing as a group, we're individuals doing... It's very soloistic, so you have to take ownership of that. Um, it's something that gives me a chance to, to shine as a violinist and also do chamber music. And orchestral music is similar in that way, but I'm second violin, for example, in the concert orchestra, so I don't get to play nearly as many tunes as I do here. So for me... I really think it'll be sort of refreshing artistically, if you like, uh, to just recharge those, those skills that I don't always use in the, the concert orchestra. A lot of musicians maybe think, oh, um, yes, I've he heard about the Scarborough gig, uh, little tin pot um, orchestra, chamber group, call it what you will. But, I mean, we've had, lots, we've had quite a few deputies in over the years, and as soon as they get here and they realise what they have to do that very morning... On no rehearsal. On no rehearsal. They suddenly think, ah, it's not quite as easy as I thought it was going to be. You know, because for most concerts you have a three-hour rehearsal for every single concert, you know. I think the hard thing is... Well, no, no, I think the great thing is that because we are a small group, we can play music the way we want to play it. Mm. You know, if you, if you feel sometimes like playing a tune, you know that you've got friends in the orchestra, people will go with you that, for that phrasing. So it's a perfect job for a musician, really. You, you get to be musical. You're not being told always how to do it. it it's wonderful chamber ensemble music, allowing musicians to be musical. It's, it's something that people can... Enjoy without having to think too much, but if you do delve into it, there's so much to see. I mean, some of the orchestrations of these things, the Eric Coates stuff, you know, it, it's on a par with anything Wonderful. by Ravel yes. or, or, or Debussy or any of those great orchestrators. Yes. The counter melodies that are going on and the, and the clarity with which it comes through. And of course, the tunes are fantastic, and I get to play a lot of them.
I'm Stephen Walker. I'm uh, officially the music librarian for the Scarborough Spar Orchestra and um, because other duties would normally come under the heading of Dog's Body, Paul has very kindly called me assistant to the musical director. And I think archivist too. Yes, um, that again isn't official, it's purely a personal interest. There's been music on the spa for at least 170 years, the, the height of the Victorian era when the, uh, the wealthy classes would come to take the waters and parade around the promenades. Uh, some enterprising gentlemen who uh, owned the spa at the time decided that uh, if he put entertainment on, they would pay for it. So he began by engaging a few local musicians at a very, very low rate and uh, eventually that became professional brass band or military band and that's, that ran for uh, perhaps 50, 60 years. By the end of 1911 it's recorded that the shareholders thought the musicians were a band of undertakers. Not a very bright prospect for the future so they uh, began to look around a bit and went to uh, London and engage the principal musical director of the Wyndham Theatres, Alec McLean. He arrived in 1912 and it's recorded that he said um, they've had nothing but brass bands since time immemorial. I frightened them out of their lives by giving them an orchestra. That was the first time strings appeared regularly on the spa as an orchestra rather than a band. And so we date our origin from 1912. And there were other things like that happening around the country at the same time? I think every principal seaside resort in the land had its own orchestra, even the smaller ones, Bridlington a little further down the road, Whitby, north of here, Blackpool, Brighton, everywhere had a seaside summer season orchestra. Perhaps you could tell us about some of the, the key characters in the history and some, some special moments. Alec McLean... Um, served here for 24 years. Unfortunately, he became very ill on the eve of his uh, 25th season. I guess the next most important musical director was Tom Jenkins, who did two years in the early 1950s. He was, um, by that time, the conductor of what I suppose was radio's flagship-like music programme, Grand Hotel, which ran through the 50s and into the 60s. I'm sure I remember listening to it on a Sunday evening at university. <laughs> Tom Jenkins recorded, either in his diary or a letter to his wife, that um, the audience tonight, whichever night that was, numbered 2,000. So in, in those days, in the 50s, the Grand Hall was absolutely packed to the rafters. And, and, uh, and since the 50s, has the... Uh, has the orchestra um, got smaller sort of gradually or have there been major major steps? I think uh, gradually and it's always been for financial reasons mm -hmm. which probably goes without saying. By the time um, probably the biggest name to lead the orchestra, Max Jaffa, arrived uh, we were down to 15 members including Max Jaffa himself and now we're 10. But, but still you get this wonderfully rich rich sound from the ensemble it's uh... yes and it's a very different sound from Max Jaffa's orchestra I think if we heard that orchestra again it would sound rather thin he had only strings woodwind and percussion of course Max Jaffa is a huge and famous figure um, and a wonderful one to have been associated with the orchestra he was probably the the biggest coup that the uh, Scarborough Borough Council brought off in uh, engaging Max Jaffa he was almost certainly at the height of his popularity. He'd been associated with Grand Hotel and many other radio programmes. He'd had television series and he came to Scarborough and brought lots and lots of people into the Grand Hall to hear him. He played for 26 years and in all that time only ever missed one concert. Uh, and he played through considerable pain at times. We, we saw him hobble onto the stage with a bad back or a, a bad shoulder, but he, he was there every day and the audience absolutely worshipped him. Coach loads of ladies would arrive bearing cakes, specially iced for the occasion. <laughs> he was uh, a matinee idol of Scarborough, really, <laughs> even at his age.
As the setting sun illuminated the castle and the town on the opposite side of the bay, it was time for the evening concert in the newly refurbished Victorian Grand Hall. So the orchestra have just come on stage. The gentlemen are all dressed in uh, dinner jackets and black bow ties, and the ladies are in various tones of lilac and purple. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Now we're going to play you a, a very popular classic. This is a piece by Saint-Saëns and it's uh, the one with skeletons dancing until dawn, uh, where they're rudely awakened by the crowing of the dawn cockerel, and they all quietly disappear into the distance. The Sasson Das Macabre. <laughs> What have you enjoyed so far? Well, I enjoy all the music. I like the dance for Carvey. I really do like that. And who do you enjoy watching, playing, up uh, in this orchestra? Up who have you been watching? The little flautist play, playing. <laughs> she, she was, you know, fascinated. Because then she went on to the piccolo, didn't she? Yes. And uh, each one has a lot to do because they play several instruments, don't they? Particularly the percussion. Mm. Yes. Oh, yes. He raced about like a little, like a little greyhound from one side to the other. Very busy. Mm. Yes, yes. Yes. I've loved it. Every minute of it.
Continuing to attract a new audience is vital to the ongoing health of any orchestra. So what about the future of this one? Stephen Walker and first Paul Laidlaw. What is interesting is that people who are getting elderly, their children tend to bring them to look after them. Then when the elderly people sadly pass on, the younger lot, who are, oh, they're nearly 50, um, they sort of become the next set of regular audiences. I think, I mean, you know, there's no way this is ever going to really seriously appeal to, to teenagers and, and young people. It's not what it's for, but there are an awful lot of people 50-plus in this country, and they deserve to be catered for just as much as anybody else. And do you, do you take that into account in your uh, programme planning? Yes, I mean, we're always, uh, you know, each, each season we introduce some new stuff, and the new stuff tends to, most of it tends to be actually things from films and television series that are currently playing, but we're never going to let go of the, of the popular old stuff as well. But the senior end of the uh, population is the biggest and fastest growing sector of the population, and there will always be a good number of people who enjoy rattling good tunes, which is what our light music is, really. The orchestra attracts people to Scarborough, and that's certainly part of the reason it's survived for almost a century. It's funded by the council and is fiercely defended by the locals. Spa manager Jeremy Hartill remains optimistic about the future. I think the orchestra's back in fashion. I think the light classical music it plays is back in fashion again. Actually, along with the British seaside, I think there's a renaissance of the, in a way, the traditional summer holiday. So I think, I think that's got a great future. We see it as broadening its appeal. You've been and watched them, I think, particularly the lunchtime outdoor concerts are a really pleasant family-centred, you know, nice morning of light music in a, in a fantastic setting. What do you think Scarborough would be like without the Spa Orchestra? I think uh, it would be a, a less attractive place. It's, it would be one of those things that you just notice something was missing. You, it's part of the landscape here, and it would be a, a poorer landscape without it. So that's the end of my day with the Scarborough Spa Orchestra. I've come outside once again to look at the bay as night falls. And it's just been one day at the start of the orchestra's season. But what I'm left with most strongly of all is the orchestra's amazing professionalism and sheer enjoyment of playing this huge variety of music. And I think that the audience really appreciate and value that. But there are so many people who come back year after year and the music is what makes our holiday. <laughs>